Heavenly Father, I do thank you that you have given me a word for this place today. Heavenly Father, open hearts and open minds to receive what you have for them. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, the title of my message today is Personal Baggage. Uh, I, uh, I did a uh, sermon some time ago uh, called Obstacles to Grace. And uh, I'm kind of taking from that, but I've expanded it and gone a little deeper. And uh, I, I want to look at those three words to begin with. Obstacles to grace. You know, we, we all know what obstacles are, right? We've all heard of obstacles. We've all had obstacles. We've all experienced obstacles in our life. But the dictionary, Webster's Dictionary, defines an obstacle as something that impedes progress or achievement. Something that impedes progress or achievement. That's what an obstacle is. You know, we've all heard of obstacle course, right? And an obstacle course is designed to impede the progress of those that are on it. And as you go over it, you know, the military uses obstacle courses. And you go through the obstacle course a whole bunch of times. It's a lot different the 50th time than it is the first time. Why? Because you learn how to negotiate obstacles. Or as Pastor Hagen would say, obstacles. <laughs> so, but the word too, that's an interesting word. We don't really always, we don't really hear a lot of people spending a much, uh, time on defining to, T-O. It's two letters. It's, you know, in language all the time. It's probably in uh, a whole bunch of sentences that we use. But uh, the one thing I, I want you to see about uh, the word two is that it, it implies moving. It implies motion, right? If you're going to, it's the first two letters of the word toward, right? Obstacles to grace. So here we see obstacles, impediments, and here we see the word to, which means to move forward. And if we look at both of those together, then, then that would mean an obstacle is an impediment to forward progress. Right? An obstacle is an impediment to forward progress. But, you know, that leaves out our third word. Does anybody remember what it is? It's grace. It's grace. That's our goal, isn't it? That's what we all want. That's why we all become Christians. It's so we can walk in the grace of God. You know, we've always heard, you know, the, the common definition of grace is God's unmerited favor. That, I mean, and it is. We, we don't merit it. We didn't do anything to earn it. However, uh, we still get it. But there's evidently then, you know, and this is, this is where I'm going with this message, there's evidently something that stops us from getting to it as Christians because the one thing that I hear Christians say all the time, even people in ministry, is I'm not there yet. Isn't there more? Isn't there something else? Isn't there something else that I can attain and achieve? Because uh, I don't feel like this should be all there is. So, well, why is that? Why do people get in that position? Jeannie and I were actually talking about that this morning. You know, a, a lot of times, you know, we've heard a lot about people who, whose life has ended prematurely. God doesn't take people before their time. You can't convince me of that. You'll never be able to convince me of that. So what happens? There must have been an obstacle in their life that stopped them from living a full life. Most of the time, well, it's not most of the time. I think it's all the time. But we're talking about obstacles from a little bit 
a different perspective. And, you know, I want you to see how you can improve your life. You know, I, I keep thinking, you know, we should have had these out yesterday. And I could have told the people in the marriage conference, if you come home and see this, your marriage needs work. <laughs> if the bags have been packed and stacked by the door, hey, wake up and smell the coffee. Anyway, uh, but, you know, we all want to know how we can improve our lives by getting to know God better, right? I mean, every Christian I've ever talked to has that on their mind at some level. I wish I, wish I knew the Bible better. I wish I read my Bible more. I wish I knew more Christian music. I wish I was more consistent in church. I wish I had something to offer the body of Christ. You do. Every single one of you has something to offer the body of Christ. But, you know, I don't want to oversimplify it. Uh, and, but I want to boil it down to the bare bones so we can see what it is. What is our personal baggage. You know, I had an instructor at Rama, uh, and he told us over and over and over, God's only interested in three things. Doug Jones. God's only interested in three things. And he said that throughout several of his classes, and eventually he got to what those three things were. And I said, well, you know, I didn't come here uh, to, to, to get, you know, Bible one or the ABCs of the Bible. But I did. I didn't think I did. I thought, oh, well, here I am at Bible college. I, I need to be getting, uh, you know, really intellectual lectures. And he said, God's only interested in three things. And the three things he said God was interested in, number one is the lost. The lost, everywhere you look. He gave all kinds of examples from the Bible of God being interested in the lost, especially Jesus. He made that pretty clear. But, you know, he even pointed out that people in hell are interested in the lost. Right? Remember uh, the rich man and Lazarus? The rich man had gone to hell, and, and he looked up into Abraham's bosom and saw Lazarus and said, let Lazarus dip his finger in water and touch, my, touch it to my tongue. But if he can't do that, tell him to go to my brothers and tell them so they don't end up here. So he was in hell and he was still interested in the lost. You know, the second thing that he said God's interested in is us getting the fullness of what he has. We, we need to get everything we possibly can from God, whatever that involves. The fullness of the, what the Word expo, ex, exposes, the fullness of what the Spirit has to offer, the fullness of our ministry in, in, on this earth. And then the final thing he was in, he's interested in is us growing up spiritually. And I think that's what we're not doing. Sure got quiet. Is this Presbyterian church? Got real quiet in here. But by the time he got to those three points, I realized I want more. This is exactly why I came to Bible college. And he's hitting on all the stuff I need to hear. I'm an idiot for thinking like I thought before. And I bought every single class tape that I had with that particular instructor. What hinders our spiritual growth? We could all list numerous things that we faced that, that made it more difficult to get close to God, right? Stress at work, full calendar. Brian mentioned that earlier. Uh, uh, problems with your family, problems with friends, problems with coworkers. You, you need a new car. Your bank account isn't where it should be, where you think it, you want it to be. You know, all those things are, are, are going to distract us from doing what we need to do or 
making progress. And they're all obstacles that need to be negotiated. So, you know, I, I initially called this obstacles to grace, and I realized as I was preparing, it's not plural. There's only one obstacle. There's only one. I want everybody, look at the person on your right. Now look at the, it's a wall. Okay, That's a wall, Darren. Now look at the person on your left. You know, and, and uh, what did you just see? Wall. <laughs> Byron's got walls on both sides. Look in front of you. Okay. Look around at the people in this room. When you look at the people of this room, you're witnessing every single person in this room's biggest obstacle in grace, to grace, themselves. You are your own biggest obstacle. And why is that? Because everywhere you go, myself included, everywhere we go, we're bringing personal baggage. And it affects how we think, it affects how we talk, it affects how we respond. Listen to this, Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 5, I'm reading from the New King James, says, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded, that's another way of saying fleshly, carnal, right? How many of you uh, have ever gone to Los Charros? <laughs> and they ask you, and you order taco salad. And they say, uh, pollo or carne? That's the word, carne. It means flesh. It means flesh in the Greek. It means meat. Means our fleshly bodies are interfering with things. It's the carnality of our lives. To be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Hmm. Hmm. Verse 7 Because the carnal mind is enmity, we could say that the carnal mind, the things that we do that are fleshly, are enemies of God. If they're enemies of God, then they're obstacles to those who are living for God or trying to live for God and get places that they haven't been as Christians. Our flesh is an obstacle. For it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. He can't do anything with our flesh. That's what I'm going to talk to you about. We have to do something with our flesh. He created it. He, he put us here on earth. But, you know, our, our leaders gave it up. Adam and Eve gave it up. So now we have to contend with all this stuff. But thank God he's given us a way to do that through Jesus. The biggest obstacle to, to grace in all of our lives is our own flesh. It's our own flesh. So that means then uh, the biggest obstacle that keeps you from being all you can be, that's not a commercial for the army, is your own personal baggage. Because those things that we have that we're responding to from the flesh, whatever that may be, are not something that God made. Not something that God created. Not something that God intended for us to do. They're things that we do because we want to. Sometimes intentionally knowing that it's wrong. Sometimes not knowing. And many times not caring. Because we want to. To do it. Has anybody ever done anything just because you wanted to and known it was wrong? 
How many of you have eaten more than three pieces of pie at Thanksgiving? Hmm. Should you have? Did you know you shouldn't before you ate the fourth one? I think so. That's just a simple example. But, you know, what other things are there? That's giving into your flesh. If we do it with food, what else are we going to do it with? Many other things. We all have different desires, and, and, and that leads to different mistakes. You know, when you go to a counselor or a psychiatrist, you know, they'll start talking it to you about your problem, right? You know, the, the classic example, right? The, the guy goes in and lays down on the couch and uh, says, what's going on today? Well, I, I got a problem with my mother. And the, and the psychiatrist will say, unpack that for me. Doesn't he? Have you heard that phrase? Let's unpack that. Well, if, if, if you have something in your life, and I'm not speaking against counseling, I'm not speaking against any of that kind of stuff. I'm just saying, if you have something in your life that you know you shouldn't be doing, you don't need to unpack it. You need to take whatever that baggage is that's got all that stuff in it that you don't know you shouldn't be doing and throw it in the river. There's a river new here, right? Am I pointing the right way? That way. I'm turned around. Throw it in the river. But, but if our personal baggage is hindering us, how do we change it? See, I'm not just going to tell you that you can just automatically get rid of it. There's something you can do that will help you change that. Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. I I go to this probably more than I go to any other scripture when I'm preaching. It says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God... I beg with you. I plead with you. That's what beseech means. By the mercies of God that you offer your bodies, your flesh, your carnality. As what? A living sacrifice. What do you do when when you sacrifice something? kill it. Yeah, you lay it down. But, but to take it a step further, you kill it. What, what, what did the pagan worshipers do you know, when they offered something? You know, usually it was a human sacrifice. They didn't let them live. They killed them. You know, when, when Abraham uh, did 5,000 cows, I don't think it was 5,000. Was it 400? Yeah. He did a lot of cows. At the same time, what did were they? Did he, they all go back out to pasture after that? No, everybody was covered in blood because of the cows that Abraham killed at the altar as a sacrifice. A sacrifice is something you completely give up to the point that you kill it, and if it's dead, then it can't have any role in your life anymore. Something dead can't hurt you. Can it? It can if you let it. It can if you keep thinking about it. It can if you let it go over and over and over and over and over and over in your minds, which is exactly what we're going to talk about. You offer your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Killing the flesh is reasonable and expected from God, which is your reasonable service. Number two, don't be conformed. Do not be conformed. I'm going to get to that in a little bit, to this world. 
but be transformed. Well, you know what transform means? The, the Greek word for transform is metamorpho. We get our word metamorphosis from that word. What's a metamorphosis? Complete and total change of everything. What happens when a caterpillar, I almost said butterfly first, when a caterpillar becomes a butterfly? What's that called? It's a metamorphosis. When we homeschooled our girls, we got little monarch butterfly. Uh, well, they weren't butterflies yet. We got a chrysalis and hung it in a little terrarium and watched them. And they didn't look like caterpillars anymore. They were completely different creatures. Well, what's, uh, what's 1 Corinthians 10, 13 say? If any man is in Christ, he's a new creation or new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That's metamorphosis. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. It's not in my notes. Sorry, guys. Or, sorry, Claire. You're, I know you're not a guy. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We transform our mind to get it in line with what God's word says. Then our minds and our spirits can act together to get our flesh under control. That's the only way. Because God's not going to control our flesh for us. Why? Because he's given us a free will to choose what to do. And why do we do this? Why do we transform our minds? So we can prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. If, if you are going to prove something, how many math people? Weren't we talking about math yesterday? Who's the math person? You're a math person? My daughter was a math, is a math person. But when you're, there's a certain, I did, I'm not a math person. I, I did not even take algebra in high school. I took general math and quit. They said, you've met your requirement for math. I'm done. Although I went to college and I had to have algebra to graduate. Yes. But in high school, I didn't. But th isn't there a, a certain segment of math where you do proofs? Yes. Is that geometry? Trigonometry. Trig. And what are you doing when you do a proof? You're proving an equation. You're proving what is written down on the paper. Well, when we renew our mind, we can prove the will of God. And if we can prove the will of God, then that means we can know the will of God. It's in the Bible. I didn't write it. Just telling you what it says. The only way to change how we behave is to change how we think. Everything we say and everything we do as human beings begins as a thought. And if you can control those thoughts, you can control your actions and you can control your words. Our personal baggage is the stuff that we've carried around with us for a lifetime and have never adequately dealt with. That's what the world and the devil want you to believe. You can't deal with it. It's too big. It's too much. You can't deal with it. You're just going to have to live with it. You're going to have to tote it around with you the rest of your life. That gets heavy. I didn't, Brian, give me an example of carrying around too much. I carry around too much. I lost a bunch of weight, and now I've put some of it back on. I'm going to get it off. Amen. Well, listen to Romans 12, 1 and 2 in the, in the Message Bible. Here's what I want you to do. God helping you take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. 
embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. But listen to this next sentence. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. It's just a response. I do this. I say this. How many of you have catchphrases that you say? How many of you, uh, <clears throat> there's probably nobody in here, how many of you know somebody that, has, that uses profanity naturally? Yes. It just comes out of their mouth. My grandfather. My grandfather could cuss in rhyme. <laughs> and it almost sounded eloquent. <laughs> And it was natural. You know, just like, you know, we've heard the term cuss like a sailor. You know, when you get in the military, you know, a lot of times when you join the military, you're in with a bunch of kids who've never been away from home and they're going to spread their wings. And one of the ways a kid spreads their wings is by using profanity. And if you keep using it and using it and using it, then it becomes a natural part of your vocabulary. So you don't even know it. Without even thinking, you become part of the culture. Instead, here's a fix. It says fix. Fix your attention on God. Yes. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity. Right? Here's you. Everywhere you go. You can't let it go. This one's kind of heavy. You got something in there? A Bible. Yeah, thanks. Oh, a body. Dead body in there. The severed head. Somebody's flesh. We need to go throw it in the river, right? But if we want to, the best Christian life, in order to obtain God's highest and best, we have to start thinking like God thinks. Hmm. You know, John Mayer uh, released a song in 2006 called Waiting on the World to Change. Know that song? It's pretty famous. Pretty. I don't know much modern music, but I know that one. I'm just waiting on the world to change. There's a line in there, though, that really kind of stood out to me. It says, uh, one of the lines is, it's hard to beat the system when you're standing at a distance. Oh, well, that's not for me to interfere with. If I say the wrong thing, they might ostracize me. If I say the wrong thing, I might lose my job. If I say or do the wrong thing, then somebody might not like me. Get over it. What did they do to Jesus? I think they tortured him and then killed him. And, and, and he knew that was going to happen. And didn't change what he said. Didn't change what he did. And he says greater things than these will you do because I go to be with my father. Yes. That word conformed that I just read in Romans 12 too, but don't be conformed to this world. Uh, has been translated as masquerade. <laughs> Don't masquerade as the world. Don't dress up like the world. I, I see, I see uh, th there's people that I know who are Christians that Halloween is more important to them than Christmas. And I don't mean like celebrating Jesus at Halloween. I mean dressing up like a witch and putting blood on themselves and... It's like, you're masquerading. 
Well, what, what, what do we masquerade as every day? Do, do I masquerade as somebody who tolerates sin? So I can make my way in life? Or do I take a stand and say, no, I'm not going to participate in that behavior? That behavior isn't something that God wants me to do. Well, how do we get there? How am I doing on time, Pastor? I know what time it is. Okay, I got like 45 more minutes. No, I'm kidding. (laughs) I'm actually getting ready to close. Joshua chapter 1. You want to know how to do it? I'm getting ready to show you. Joshua chapter 1 first says, Only be strong and very courageous. That you may observe to do all. How much? What's that leave out? All. That is according to the law which Moses my servant commanded you. For us as New Testament Christians, everything written in the Bible, do it. Do, uh, do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left. What did Jesus say about the straight and narrow path? You've got to stay on it. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. Here's the one. This, this, this might be my banner scripture. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. That's another way of saying the Bible shall always be in your mouth. You shall always have a word from God to speak at any given moment because you never know what the situation is going to do. So you should be filling up on the word of God all the time. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate in it, how often? How many hours a day is it day? How many hours a day is it night? What's that equal? When should we be meditating on the Word of God? 24 hours a day. Seven days a week. We should meditate on the Word of God as much as 7-Eleven is opened. And on Christmas Day. 24 7. Thou shalt meditate in it day and night that thou mayest observe to do. He tells us how we're going to get to the point where we can do it. It's by concentrating on this, not this. Concentrating on this, not this. For then. You will make your way prosperous and have good success. You. Doesn't say God. God's done everything he's ever going to do for you. Except come back. He provided everything you need at the cross. So now we have to access it and apply it to our lives then we can be successful. Meditate means to mutter. I I referenced this yesterday when we were talking to the men. Mutter. Say it over and over and over and over to yourself. One one of the uh, word pictures in the Hebrew is like a cow chewing its cud. Uh, Ever driven by a, a, a field where there's cows? What are they doing? Or they bend down and get more. You know, they don't just pull it up and swallow it. They grind it into almost nothing. It's almost a liquid when they swallow it. How many of you have ever been told to chew your food 20 times? You're supposed to chew your cud too. 
It doesn't take a rocket science to understand what meditate is. To get rid of your personal baggage without unpacking it by transforming your mind, then you will have successfully navigated the biggest obstacle to grace there is, and that's yourself. Here, you need to memorize this verse. John 2, 5. This is Jesus at the wedding at, at Cana. Remember, he turned water into wine, his first miracle. And, uh, you know, he says, woman, my time has not yet come. To his mom. Woman is actually a respectful term. But, uh, he said, my time has not yet come. She didn't even respond. She turned to the servants and said, whatever he says to you, do it. That's it. If we're in the word like we should day and night, then we're going to know what it was that he said, and then we can do it. The instructions aren't complicated. Listen to this out of the, uh, I forget. Can you hear me now? Do I need to start over? Joshua 2.5. In the New King James says, whatever he says to you, do it. John, what did I say? I'm sorry, I just read Joshua. John 2, 5. Whatever he says to you, do it. In the Message Bible, it says, whatever he tells you, do it. Dewey Ream says, whatsoever he shall say to you, do ye. You know, it doesn't change that much when you look at uh, other translations. Whatever Jesus says, do. We've got it hanging on a, on a, we wrote it on a big blackboard in our house. Whatever he says to you, do it. You know, we, we, we need, if we're not meditating, then we're not listening. If we're not in the word all the time, Pick a verse. That doesn't mean you have to have your Bible open in front of you 24-7. That means you have to find something in the Word to begin your day and keep it with you. And meditate on it. There's an easy one. Whatever he says to you, do it. Whatever he says to you, do it. Whatever he says to you, do it. Say that over and over. Or you could change it. Whatever Jesus says to you, do it. And what did Jesus say? It's written down. It's written down. Our personal baggage is the only thing that gets in the way of us doing what he says. And we have to not unpack it, we have to unload it. Get rid of it. I'm done, Pastor. round of applause um in closing the message out if you're gonna everyone just bow your eyes and just reverence of god i don't ever like to end a service or a, a time where we don't have an opportunity to uh take into action what we just heard so be glad today is not a throw your baggage at the altar service just drop it where it's at. We'll take it to the river. God will take it to the river for you. So if you're in this room today, or you're here and uh, uh, you heard Jim's voice, now you're hearing mine, whether it's in the future, online, whatever, take your baggage and throw it. And it's simply, how do you do that? How do you grab something you can't see? How do you uh, physically take something that, that is inside of us and throw it away? You just simply say, Jesus, Remember Jesus, that's the name above everything. 
You say, God, I give this to you. And that between give and, and to you is the fill in the blank. I give the way I think to you. I give the way my thought process go, goes to you. So here's this moment of transparency. No one's looking around because you're going to look directly at me because this is my story. God, I give the baggage of always being critical to you. That's, that's how you do it. I'm super critical. I don't like it when people do certain things, I, and I'm vocal about it. And to be, to be honest, I'm negative a lot. I always focus on the negative. So God, today, I'm giving it to you. Because I can't go forward being positive when I'm always negative. It's like I'm fighting inside my face, right? So I'm giving that to you. That's how you do it. You just say, God, I'm giving this to you. I'm laying this down to you. Yours might not be being critical or negative thinking. It may be something else that comes out of your mouth. It may be uh, something that you put in your mouth. It may be something that you let build a nest in your brain. Whatever it is, that's between you and God. Don't leave this room with that baggage. And, and moving forward, maybe you're sitting in here and you're saying, Brian, I, I don't even know what it's like to have a relationship with God. I don't remember... Um, hearing this when I was younger, I don't remember hearing about a relationship with God. Well, take heed. Jesus said, hey, all you do is call upon the name of the Lord and you'll be saved. So right now, it's simple. You just ask God. You just, you just say this. You say it out loud. You can say it now. You can say it later. I encourage you not to wait another millisecond more because we don't know what tomorrow brings. But in order to ha make sure you have that, I'm going to go to heaven because I've got uh, my relationship with God set, you just simply say, Jesus, come into my life, be my Lord and be my Savior. Thank you, Jesus, for going to the cross for me. Forgive me of my sins. Help me love what you love and help me hate what you hate. In Jesus' name, amen. And when you do that, you're the new creation. You're the, you were a caterpillar, but thank God we're not caterpillars anymore. We're butterflies. And so, God, I thank you for driving this home as we, as we close up this service today, Lord God, that, that we're, we're baggage-free folks, and we know we're going to heaven, people. And so, God, I thank you that there's a change in everybody. I thank you that, there's a, uh, um, that, that we, we don't go by feelings, but, Lord God, we can sense there's a shift. We can sense the change in our lives. And, God, I give you all the praise and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen.